Hello and welcome to Alive and Composing, the wonderful world of Innova, with today's guest, Ralph Samuelson. Would you please state your name for the record? Yes, good afternoon. I am Ralph Samuelson. And we like to ask composers and performers in this case what kind of household pets they have. Do you have any cats, dogs, or interesting animals, and oh, what are their names? Oh, man. Well, we always had dogs, and we had three dogs. And then we had two dogs, and then we had one dog. And now for the last 10 months, we have no dogs for the first time in, I think, 40 years. So so you're entering a, a stage of dog attrition? Dog, dog attrition. It was a long stage of dog attrition. Did they have interesting names that reflect your personality and history? I don't know. The, the last three were named Jasper, Clementine, and Panda. But Panda was the nickname for Pandemonium. Okay, so as far as I can tell so far, nothing to do with Shakuhachi? No. Or the fact that we're sitting here in the Asian Cultural Council? No, nothing. Okay, yeah. no. what was your first sound memory? Oh, what a beautiful question. Oh my goodness. So interesting, I never even thought of that. Uh, my first sound memory must have been my mother's voice, but... Um, I can't think of a particular moment. Again, it wasn't the wind blowing through the trees or over the windows and making flute-like sounds. It wasn't. Oh. And, and my first musical instrument sound that I remember was the accordion. And that actually was my first instrument that I learned because I heard this and a couple of years later I said, oh, I, I, it just stuck with me and I wanted to play the accordion. And w why did you stop playing the accordion? So I started playing the accordion when I was five years old. I heard the accordion maybe when I was three. And I remember it because somebody in the neighborhood was, was playing it. And then around the time that I was five, the people across the street were having a yard sale and out on their lawn was this accordion. And I recognize it at the, as this instrument I'd heard, and I just sat down on their lawn and played around with it and took it home. And my father said, oh, do you want to take accordion lessons? I said, sure. So I did that for about six years. Um, but in school, uh, at that time, I grew up in a town called Pearl River in Rockland County, north of New York City. So in fourth grade, like in many American schools, you can take an instrument and join the band and so on, but there was no accordion. So I took up the clarinet and did the clarinet and the accordion together for a couple of years. And then the band teacher said, we need a saxophone player. So I started to play the saxophone and somewhere along the way, I just stopped the accordion. So you went from a misfit to someone who could actually work with school bands <laughs> yeah, right. to the shakuhachi that we're gonna get to, I'm, we'll I'm sure, in just to. a minute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you remember any kind of uh, significant moments during your youth there that really blew you away in terms of a, an art experience or a music experience or something that said there's going to be uh, a creative part to your life? So um, I liked playing music the whole time, from the accordion time. You know, uh, I loved playing Lady of Spain with Bellow Shake. And, um, and then at the school, they had like a jazz band in junior high school, and I really got into that. But then when I was about 15 or 16, we moved to uh, New York City, to Queens, and I just really started listening to uh, jazz and going into the city to hear live performances. And for some strange reason that I can never understand, for my 16th birthday, my parents gave me two records, and my parents have no musical interest, really, or sophistication, but they gave me two records. And one was John Coltrane, and one was Ravi Shankar. And I don't know where that came from, but those records stuck with me for, for so long. Um, Listening to Ravi Shankar's album, was that your first experience of Asian music or non-Western music? Absolutely. I mean, totally, and I had no idea what it was, mm -hmm. but it sounded amazing, and that was my first experience. And how did you follow that up? Um, at the time, not so much. That was just a record that I listened to a lot, uh, but um, 
I was mostly listening to jazz saxophonists and um, you know had a group in high school and on into college and played in different uh, kind of jazz and rock and big bands and so I was always playing music um, but what happened uh, after college was I went out to San Francisco uh, to go to graduate school but when I got there I decided not to go to graduate school and it was 1968 it was a great time to be in San Francisco there was a lot of music and I was just uh, oh I had started playing the flute when I was in college and so by this point I was passionate about the flute I was playing the flute everywhere and somebody handed me a recording of South Indian Carnatic music with this flutist called T. Vishwanathan. And I listened to this recording and I just thought it was the most extraordinary flute music I'd ever heard. And I read on the back of the album that this T. Vishwanathan and all of these other musicians from India were teaching at a university in Connecticut called Wesleyan University, which had a program that they called World Music. And I didn't know anything about it, so I um, went to the library, read up on it. There was, of course, no other way to find out about those things and I decided that's where I'd like to go and um, so I applied to graduate school there and I went the following uh, September my intention was I wanted to study with this T. Vishwanathan and but when I got there he was gone back to India uh, he came back to Wesleyan later but he was gone in India so I started to study ethnomusicology and world music and I wanted to play a flute of some kind and there was a flute teacher from Japan uh, teaching shakuhachi there. So that's where I met the shakuhachi. That just kind of like became a new uh, road for me. Now Wesleyan's also notorious for having interesting composers of new music yes. uh, as well as world music and they all rub together in right. interesting ways. Did, did you experience that there too and has that yes. stayed with you? Yes, absolutely. I think one of the, the, the amazing things about that music department, I think it's still true today, um, but but in the late 60s, early 70s, the field of ethnomusicology had grown in America as an academic discipline. But Wesleyan always called it world music and always called their department a music department and never made a distinction between people teaching composition, theory, uh, visiting artists from Asia or Africa teaching a performance, or the ethnomusicologists who were on, uh, on the faculty as scholars of that discipline. It was a very, very well integrated understanding of music, and I think that's what makes it uh, a really unique and special program. And what was your career path at that time? You said, I'm going to be a professional shakuhachi player on the streets of New York? Oh, yeah. Or so, yeah, I think uh, my career path was kind of understood to be towards academia. So that I would, uh, I got a master's degree, I was in a PhD program, I would get a PhD, I would uh, teach in a university. Um, I went to Japan um, in 1971 after the master's degree to study um, music in Japan and to study the shakuhachi with the best uh, teachers. And I stayed there for two years. And then I came back to Wesleyan to do two years of PhD work. And then I went back to Japan in 75 for two more years of, of study. And um, I was kind of working on a dissertation. Uh, I was studying the shakuhachi. I was learning about many aspects of Japanese music. I was traveling in Asia a bit. Um, but I, I had a child that was born. Uh, my daughter was born in Japan. And I had this grant money and little research jobs and so on, and all this money ran out. I wasn't quite sure what to do yet. And uh, somehow I got a, I can't remember how I got this, a call or a letter or something from one of my professors at Wesleyan saying there's a foundation in New York that's looking for someone uh, on the, to join their staff who has uh, expertise or knowledge about Asian performing arts you might be interested in this. So somehow I contacted these people and uh, came to New York and I ended up taking a job in this foundation that was called the JDR Third Fund, the John D. Rockefeller Third Fund. And later the name was changed to the Asian Cultural Council. And 
my idea was I would work there a couple of years and I'd finish my PhD and, and I'd go into academia. So I moved to New York with my wife and daughter and we kind of settled in and I started doing this job and I'd go home at the end of the day and do family stuff and then be like, evening, okay, I'm going to write my dissertation. But no, I want to practice the shakuhachi. So I'd practice the shakuhachi for, I thought oh, I'll practice an hour and then I'll do some research or writing. But no, I just practice two hours, three hours, till midnight. And I never wanted to work on the dissertation. So I just ended up working in this foundation and playing the shakuhachi for 30 plus years. That's what happened. Well, a lot of us are glad that you, you, you made that choice. <laughs> yeah. And you're going back to even more shakuhachi now since, since uh, leaving the foundation, right? Yeah, that's right. So I think uh, my 32 years in the foundation, um, and it's a foundation that supports uh, cultural exchange in the arts between the United States and Asia. So it gave me many opportunities to travel in Asia, to meet marvelous uh, artists and scholars who really inspired me. And some of these people we could talk about, you'll know who they are. And um, But I always kept a sort of a separate career track of playing the shakuhachi, teaching the shakuhachi, performing. Uh, and I found that this was a very important balance in my life. I would have this like day job and, and night job and it, it balanced me out. And then something happened. Um, I'm gonna take a little tangent here, but in the mid 90s, I started to have pain in my hands and uh, I didn't really know what was going on. And at that time, you know, computers had become a big part of our life. So I was in the office all day doing this, and I was home all night doing this. And my hands just started hurting more and more. Um, but I just tried to, to ignore it. And finally, I got to the point where I lost the use of my left hand. And I had to stop uh, just almost everything. And I couldn't play the flute. So there was a period of about four years where I couldn't play the shakuhachi at all. And uh, this life balance that I was talking about was totally thrown out and I was off. I just felt off balance um, and I got kind of depressed and it was a struggle and I didn't know where this was going. But after a couple of years, I got to the point where I found that I could live without playing the shakuhachi. If I never play the shakuhachi again, I'll be fine. And it was at that point that I started to also recover. Um, so that eventually I was able to start playing again. And there were a lot of things. I had some surgery and I had you know, different kinds of modalities from shamanistic healers in Korea and the Philippines to physical therapists in New York. But, but that letting go was really important. That's fascinating because the shakuhachi has always been more than just an instrument for playing tunes. It's a way of right. life, it's meditation, right. and somehow right. it was uh, yeah. your companion in this journey. Right? It was, absolutely, yeah. So that was, that was a very... Um, one of the things I learned was, um, and you might, know, you might have heard this from other musicians, but music becomes an addictive behavior. And uh, if you don't get your fix, you just like start to shake, you know. Um, it's like that. It was in my body like that. And it really took a while to, to get out of there. And perhaps even more than other instruments, your whole body and your breath is intimately connected with the sound, right? Yeah, so shakuhachi, the shakuhachi tr tradition in Japan evolved mostly in the 1600s and 1700s as a musical instrument that was taken up by a sect of Buddhist monks who used the blowing of this bamboo flute as their core spiritual practice. And the idea that they developed was the breathe in, breathe out of sitting meditation. But at the breathe out, you breathe out into a bamboo tube and make a tone. And it's the sound of human air over nature's bamboo creating this this universal tone that would that resonate somehow with, with the universe. What, what would you teach in someone's first shakuhachi lesson? 
how to hold it, how to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? Or yeah, nice question. Uh, certainly how to hold it. I think the first, of course, first of all, is how to hold it and how to breathe. Uh, and, and how to breathe is such an important part of what this instrument is, that you always have to keep teaching it and always have to keep learning it uh, yourself. Um, but then, in the Japanese tradition, you, you, unlike in Western music, there's no like scale exercises or books of etudes or something. You jump right in with little songs. So typically, the first lessons are children's songs, then folk songs, and then right into the pieces of whatever musical tradition you're, you're learning. And by the way, I think that this is maybe another conversation, and for people who know more about it than I, but that system of teaching traditional music in Japan, I think had an impact on Mr. Suzuki and the Suzuki method, which also, if I understand correctly, kind of jumps right into playing music, uh, you know, actual compositions. So you're not only a master of the traditional aspect and everything that you bring to that, but you interface with Western composers who've who've uh, approached the shakuhachi themselves. Yeah. How have you been a midwife to that? How have mm -hmm. you helped them along? What are your reactions to how each one of them approaches this thing? Yeah, that's uh, so important. So when I started to study the shakuhachi, it was 1969. Uh, my first teacher was a great player called Kodo Araki V, who uh, <coughs> at the time was living in America and teaching at Wesleyan University. Then I went to Japan and studied with uh, maybe the greatest player of the late 20th century, or certainly one of the, called Goro Yamaguchi, and he became a living national treasure, and he was my uh, main teacher. I also had another teacher along the way who helped me called Shudo Yamato, so I really had three teachers. Um, and in those days, late 60s, early 70s, when I was in Japan for the first time, the number of foreigners who were studying the shakuhachi, seriously, you could count on your fingers. Um, and something happened over the next 40 years. Um, the shakuhachi emerged into the world and became a very well-known musical instrument so that today there are literally thousands of people everywhere in this country, all over Europe, in, in China, in Malaysia, in Australia, just so many people playing the shakuhachi. Uh, I've been privileged to kind of watch this instrument transition from being a musical instrument associated with a particular country, a particular historical repertoire, to being an instrument that's international and part of the uh, contemporary landscape. I think composers outside of Japan became interested in the shakuhachi because of all its kind of um, extra musical qualities, we might say, or things that uh, that American woodwind players refer to as extended techniques um, and the whole world of music it's not so much about melody and rhythm as it is about tone color and breath and and these elements of tone color and kind of breath rhythm are things that composers find very intriguing I, I believe and also and you can tell me more about this. I think also kind of meet somewhere with what happened with technology in music. Uh, so that technology enables us to go into a different sound world and some musical instruments of other cultures lead us kind of to the same place or a similar place. So if we use that as an example, your, your brand new Innova album, you've got a piece by Henry Cowell and maybe another by you, know, you, you, you name your composer, yes. maybe Richard Teitelbaum, Richard for Teitelbaum, instance. Richard Teitelbaum, Elizabeth Brown, Bun Jing Lam, yeah. So let's to start with Henry Cowell. I think, you know, the first wave of shakuhachi in America was immigrants from Japan uh, in the late 19th century. And among this wave of immigration, there were some musicians. Um, and there were some shakuhachi players in there. And Henry Cowell met one of these players uh, named uh, Kitaro Tamada. And they met in the 1920s when Cowell was in California, where he was originally from. And Cowell actually started taking lessons with him. Um, and he studied with him, I think, for quite a few years. And they developed a very close relationship. Uh, 
You might know there was a point at which Cal was actually in San Quentin prison. I think he was there for four years. And records show that uh, Tamada visited him in prison almost every month to give him a lesson. Um, it was that close. And later, Tamada himself was in a Japanese internment camp. Cowell didn't visit him, but he sent him letters, and there's records of love letters. So they had a bond, but in 1946, Cowell wrote a beautiful little piece for his teacher, um, and it's called The Universal Flute, and it's almost certainly the first American or probably the first non-Japanese composition for shakuhachi. And so that's really the beginning of composers in this country meeting the shakuhachi. Later, from the 60s on, there were several uh, university programs like Wesleyan, of course, University of Washington, UCLA, that had shakuhachi teachers from Japan teaching. So quite a few American students, again, composers among them, uh, began to be exposed to the instrument. And then you had some recordings that came on the scene. Uh, you mentioned the Watatsumi Do recording, which was called The Mysterious Sounds of the Bamboo Flute on the Everest label came out sometime in the 70s, I think, and a lot of people listened to that. But before that, in 1967, the very first shakuhachi recording widely available here was Goro Yamaguchi's uh, Bell Ringing in the Empty Sky on None Such. And a track from that ended up on the Voyager 2 spacecraft that is still circling around somewhere. Um, so composers started to hear this music and some of them started to study it or at least um, you know try to learn about it deeply and I think what we have found when we look at the repertoire of American compositions is those composers who really took the time to learn the instrument or learn about the instrument are the ones who have been most successful in making really meaningful pieces. We're eager to hear more from you and the Shakuhachi, but in the meantime, thanks so much for telling us your story, Ralph. Well, thanks for uh, letting me tell it. <laughs>